Well, thanks, Wiley, and thanks the organizers for the invitation for this uh, very excited uh, seminar series. Uh, so I want to start my talk um, by showing you this uh, movie here. This is a single embryo uh, of Xenopus. It starts from one huge cell, about one millimeter in diameter that you can see by naked eyes. And after fertilization, it starts uh, uh, to cleave into smaller and smaller cells in a highly synchronized and precise manner, about every 25 minutes per cycle. And the same process actually is well conserved across different species. So here I'm showing you a zebrafish embryo. And um, because it's transparent, you could label nuclei and a membrane uh, with the fluorescence proteins. And as you see here that not only the cell divisions are highly synchronized, but it also coordinates the downstream events such as a nuclear division. And so you may wonder if there's any timing system that uh, orchestrate all these sophisticated uh, cellular processes. And indeed, um, over the past decades, uh, studies have identified a group of molecules that can interact with each other to form this positive and negative feedback loops that seems to self-sustain these oscillations. And what's more is that, uh, so specific for this case, um, you have uh, the maternally deposited mRNA cyclin B uh, to translate into cyclin B as the input of the clock. And it binds to cyclin dependent kinase to turn it on. So when CDK1 is turned on, it seems to coordinate a lot of downstream events such as chromosome condensation, nuclear envelope breakdown, and spindle formation. So that drives the cells into mitosis. And its activation also activates its own repressor, the anaphase promoting complex, uh, which is a E3 ubiquitin ligase that targets cyclin B for degradation. So that's how you get uh, through this one, uh, complete the one cycle. And, um, and there are um, other regulators such as CDC25 and V1, which plays a role to form this important uh, double negative and double positive feedback loop so that the CDK1 not simply follows cyclin B as mass action kinetics, but switching from, on to, from off to on in a very bistable switch manner. Um, so this uh, we will uh, discuss later, but uh, the cell cycle circuit is just uh, one of the many biological oscillators. Uh, you may or you may not know in the biological system, but they play a very important role uh, to control uh, the timing processes in uh, many in cells and development. And their time scales also span orders of magnitude. Uh, if you interrupt the clock function, uh, it can link to many diseases. So it's important for us to understand what maintains the stable clock functions. And um, so despite the diversity of these clocks, um, all of them seem to share some fundamental essential functions uh, that are crucial for, for all of these. And first of all, um, like as any timing system, you have to be precise um, for the clock. And studies, including our own lab, uh, has measured uh, the, um, the clock um, oscillations uh, in say cell cycles or circadian clock, they seem to be able to maintain the uh, CV as low as 3% among the population of the individuals. And additionally, this class also needs to have ability to talk to the environment and actually being able to, uh, to adjust to the external signals. So, uh, and what's interesting is a lot of oscillators, including the cell cycles, are highly tunable in frequency, but seem the amplitude to maintain a stable uh, state, um, I mean, a stable level. level. Um, so that is something called a frequency modulation, which I will talk uh, later as well. And last but not least, uh, these clocks need to be robust. Although it's still open question what drives the robustness. Uh, there has been studies uh, to show that many systems from uh, bacterial chemotaxis to developmental patterning, they seem not to require the fine tuning of the parameters. Instead, they develop this robust network uh, that seems to play the role to, to maintain the stable function. So, um, 
to study the, um, you know, how network connect to function is actually not an easy task, especially if you're looking at uh, the clock molecular pathway, such as I'm showing here for cell cycle. Typically, they contain hundreds of molecules, and it's also embedded in the larger complicated cellular networks. So it's challenging to gain insights by just looking at this, um, you know, complicated networks. So instead, our lab, uh, we actually share um, the same uh, philosophy as what Ben just showed you uh, for this bottom-up synthetic biology. So we wonder, can we uh, design a minimum oscillator or identify some minimum components that plays a role uh, that maybe complicated uh, biological oscillator do, and just to gain insight what controls what function. Uh, so this topic actually is not really new. Uh, actually, it's dated back to the classical Goodwin oscillator, uh, where in theory, you could design a very simple oscillator with a gene repressed itself. And obviously, the time delay here is important so that it's not dampened into a, steady, a stable steady state. And, um, and since then, there have been actual um, biological oscillators, especially the genetic oscillators that have been engineered in the E. coli cells. So here I'm showing you two examples. Uh, the repressor, which has uh, three genes that repress one another. And additionally, you could add a, a self-positive feedback to form this um, positive plus negative feedback loop. And what's interesting about the last uh, topology is that uh, it seems to be also uh, found in many natural oscillators. Although these oscillators have all different molecular mechanism, they, there seems to always have this, um, there's a core topology that has this positive plus negative feedback. So the question would be, um, so if we know the single negative feedback loop is sufficient to create the limit cycle oscillations, why in nature uh, we see again and again this positive feedback loop that seems to be well, well conserved across different organisms and also across different clocks. So um, in fact, uh, this question has been um, um, explored by a computational study. Uh, so here uh, they compare three topologies that all share the same core, which is a repressed letter that I just talked about. And then they add one um, core with a self-positive feedback, and they add a self-negative feedback to another. So then uh, they compare the performance of these oscillators by random parameter scans uh, to see how many parameter sets to support a certain topology for oscillation. And they found uh, the ones that with a positive feedback added seems to increase the robustness. However, this um, the this view seems to be uh, different in another study. And in this study, uh, they engineered a, a positive plus negative feedback loop um, by bacterial quorum sensing. So they formed this oscillator at a population level. And then if they engineer additional negative feedback loop, that seems to increase the robustness. So what do we think maybe the discrepancy between the two studies are that each of the studies only look at one specific topology. However, uh, in evolution, we should expect that there are many different designs that can achieve the same function. And maybe some are better than the others. Um, but in order to identify the fundamental principles, we have to look at them all. So that actually motivated us to start this project uh, that led by two talented graduate students here. And so here, instead of uh, looking at one or two topologies, we look at the whole topology space. And then we map that topology space to a functional space. And Jenda has initiated this um, computational framework to study the robustness of the oscillations. And Franco uh, followed up to continue to study the tunability of the clock. And uh, what we have here is um, we can um, identify uh, 1,420 clock topologies um, for all the three node or two node networks. And we arranged it in the atlas of the oscillation, such as uh, they start from the simplest at the bottom and all the way to the top that is most complicated design. And each dot here is one topology. They can connect to another by adding or removing a node or an edge uh, to convert to another. And um, now the bottom eight of them actually are minimum designs because if we remove any node or, or edge, they just stop to be ability to, to be an oscillator. 
So what are these? Uh, these are the eight cores, um, and we arranged based on their Q values. Um, and the Q values here is just the hit rate of the random parameter scan. So the higher of the Q value, the more robust they are. So we found that there are three topologies that are orders of magnitude higher robust than the rest of five. So we call this uh, three robust cores and five non-robust cores. So what are these three? These three are actually the ones that we are familiar with, I just introduced, uh, that's repress later, positive plus negative feedback loop, and a good win oscillator. And so we wonder, can these three be responsible for the robustness of the whole network, right? So to find it out, we just group the topologies in the atlas based on their core compositions. And what we found that the groups that are least robust are actually the ones, the networks that only contain the non-robust cores. So it's any combination of the five non-robust cores. And however, the, the uh, robustness becoming more and more higher and higher if you have more robust cores. And so that indicates that the core, robust cores plays an important role. However, it's not only that. Um, and we've also identified some local, uh, we call a hidden motif, because these motifs are not required for oscillation. However, we found that they are also important to um, be responsible for the robustness of the network. So to show that, uh, we group the atlas uh, topologies now in two dimension. And uh, regardless of what cores they have, we simply count how many nodes that have this incoherent input interaction and how many nodes have the coherent input interactions. So we found that the, the more incoherent inputs they have, the less coherent inputs they have, the more robust they are. And this effect seems to be additive. And as an example here, uh, I'm showing you the two cores. Um, so core two and core six. And these two cores are, are actually quite identical. As you show, as you see that um, they both have a slow negative feedback loop coupled with a fast positive feedback loop. However, their Q value can um, be um, different in orders of magnitude. And um, so we found that uh, it's actually because of the local interactions that core two has a positive feedback adding to uh, the activator to create the incoherent input, and of course it's create a coherent input. And what's interesting is uh, in natural oscillators or uh, the known synthetic oscillators, seems all of them um, can apply the core two, but I don't seem to find um, the oscillators with a core six. And so this incoherent input seems to also unify the previous findings. So it turns out that it's not really positive or negative feedback loop that matters. It's, it's in terms of where to add. So uh, on, a, on both the cases, you add it to create this incoherent input interaction. So just to summarize this part, um, so uh, it seems the topology plays an important role and we have identified some simple rules um, for both core architecture that plays an important uh, uh, role, but also the local interactions, specifically the incoherent input interactions that uh, can increase the oscillator robustness. So this may explain why in nature we have so complicated network design and some of these you know, highly evolved structures that are not ice, uh, are not required of oscillation, but still uh, well uh, evolved, uh, probably because these peripheral structures have some kind of function uh, that is important for the clock performance. Now, experimentally, we could also design some minimum system. So here, what I'm showing is uh, to group the uh, frog X, the adenomous X that I just showed at the beginning, and then take only the cytosolic portion and inject that into a microfluidic chamber filled with oil. So that will create this water in oil emulsion. And we create a, a comparable to the cell size to uh, mimic the cell behavior. And here we just uh, reconstitute the cell cycle circuit in these droplets. And um, that allows us to, um, to do manipulations and do quantification of these clocks. So this is our initial choice. And what we have here, um, the, uh, the, the droplets here, these are the minimum uh, cells we call because this only have cytosol. 
And we have a uh, securing, which is anaphase substrate fused with the fluorescence protein as an indicator uh, for these oscillations. So these uh, securing M cherry translated as an interface. So you see the, it's getting brighter and then degraded as a mitotic phase. And this, each cell can uh, oscillate about 30 to 40 cycles over multiple days. So it's a pretty nice system. Now, if we add in the sperm DNA into the system, uh, it can self-assemble nuclei, as you see uh, in these channels here. And um, so what's nice about is uh, if you try to focus one of the droplets of the four channels, uh, you see that these nuclear events, including the nuclear envelope breaks down and the chromosome condensation and decondensation is highly correlated with the clock. So that means this clock is functional uh, to control the downstream metallic events uh, in, in our system. Now, what's uh, still um, not uh, ideal is this uh, reporter. So this is an mRNA-based reporter. So that means that um, we, we actually um, missed uh, the very early cycles, uh, many of them, even though we know the cycles are there because we know downstream events are oscillating. And that's because the mRNA, uh, I mean, the, the M cherry here uh, requires a maturation time. And it also makes this amplitude less reliable. And so uh, to address that, uh, Gambu, a postdoc fellow in our lab, designed a FRET kinase sensor that can directly um, uh, detect the cyclin dependent kinase activity. And what I'm showing you on the right here, the video, it shows that it's nicely detecting the CDK1 activity oscillation in both uh, non-nuclear uh, droplets and the droplets with nuclear. And so with this system, we could reliably measure period and amplitude simultaneously. And that allows us to uh, dissect a lot of uh, questions that related to the CDK1 network. So the first thing we want to understand is related to this frequency modulation that I introduced at the beginning. And in theory, there has been prediction that uh, cell cycle can be tuned by just changing the synthesis rate of the cycling B, which is the input of the clock. And then to show that the period can be tuned in a wide uh, range, but amplitude is maintained at a certain level. And this is the, to show cell cycle is frequency modulated. And um, however, circadian clock has been shown that to be amplitude modulated by reducing reagents. And additionally, in signaling transduction pathway, there has been both amplitude and frequency modulation discussed. So um, we want to use our experimental system to first test if this cell cycle, the CDK1 metallic circuit, is frequency modulated by cycling B. So to do that, we, 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 we set up this two-channel tuning device. So before we create the droplets, we attaching uh, the water phase into two uh, channels and each channel um, attaching to a programmable pressure driven system. And uh, with that, we could change the stoichiometry of the molecules in these droplets in a continuous uh, high throughput manner. So what we first do is to reduce in the synthesis rate by adding the uh, Xenopus cycling B morpholinos. And we found that the more morpholinos we add, the cell cycle is getting slower and slower and eventually arrested. Now, if we add back the human cycling BMRA, which is not affected by Xenopus morpholinos, it can rescue the, the behavior to getting it faster and faster. And because we can measure frequency and the amplitude at the same time, we could create this amplitude of frequency dependency. And as you see here, it's a widely tuned frequency, but amplitude is maintained in a narrow range. So that means, yes, this oscillator is frequency modulated in this setup. However, to our surprise is uh, if we add nuclei into the system to create uh, this nuclear cytoplasm compartments on the same circuit responding to cycling B very differently. As I'm showing you two example traces here, the gray here is a non-nuclear droplet and it's, it's as shown it's a higher MRA showing faster oscillations, but not the nuclear droplets. And more statistically, you find that uh, the period indeed is, uh, is uh, uh, tuning down with the MRA, but the 
for the nuclear droplets is pretty flat. And this is still some, uh, some work that is uh, ongoing. We're trying to understand why this compartmentalization is affecting this uh, cell cycle behavior. But so far, we have only discussed uh, uh, one specific parameter that can be tuned uh, specifically by cycling B synthesis rate. However, uh, as we understand a cell um, can pr be present in the environment that is highly variable. And specifically, um, the temperature changing can affect the overall reaction rates and uh, cellular density has also been shown to be variable as that will affect uh, this uh, overall molecular species concentrations. So we are hoping to understand uh, how this cell cycle responding to these environmental changes and how the circuit plays a role uh, to maintain that. So uh, the, there has been uh, known that the cell cycle is highly sensitive to temperature. And indeed, the, the mitotic phase is the most sensitive phase to temperature as it shown in the mammalian cell lines. Um, however, um, we also know the cell cycle measured here is in vivo and that also um, in, in the in vivo system has um, all different uh, cellular processes. And here we are hoping to develop an in vitro system. Again, the idea of the bottom up synthetic biology by understanding whether uh, it, what is the response of the CDK1 network to the temperature uh, variation. So here we develop a temperature gradient and I'm showing you example uh, traces of single droplets. As you see here, the droplets are actually changing non-monotonically dependent on the temperature. And as I'm, I'm showing you more specific here, I found that, uh, so you, you, you can see here, uh, the, the cell cycle uh, in this in vitro setup seems to have a very wide uh, robust phase on uh, where the period is not changing too much across uh, the, the temperature range. Um, and then quickly slow down in both sides. Now for the slower part, for the low boundary part, uh, this we show it can be explained by Arrhenius laws. And then for the higher part, we still, we are still trying to understand what causes this quick slowdown um, when you increase the temperature. Now about the cell density changing, um, recently there has been studying to show even in the normal cell density range, there is still some fluctuations and specifically linked to uh, this mitotic swelling uh, phenomenon. And um, if you dilute further, um, the cells can undergo synthesis and eventually cell cycle rest. And if you concentrate it, uh, it can undergo apoptosis. So we wonder how the cell cycle in our case is responding to the uh, cytoplasmic density changing. So we use a two channel tuning again here. Um, in one channel, we uh, have this uh, uh, extract and the other channel is just a buffer. And the extract has a dye so that you can indicate what's a concentration. So we could dilute the concentration from endogenous level all the way down to the zero. And then we use the CDK1 thread to indicate on the cell cycle behavior. So what we found is the cell cycles are actually very robust to dilutions. As you see here, even dilute up to 60 to 80%, there's still some droplets that um, perform the well self-sustained oscillations. And uh, for nine independent experiments, we found the oscillation maintain 100% oscillatory um, and to a wide range of dilution until about the threshold of the 60 to 80%. And the period also maintains stable up to 50% dilution. And the cell cycle is also very robust to concentration. Uh, when we evaporate the droplet to increase the increase the concentration, we found that it can still oscillate until up to about 50% above the endogenous level when CDK1 is arrested as a high stable steady state. And what's interesting is if you dilute, re-dilute this arrested state, they can rescue the oscillation. But the rescue seems to also follow not the same trend back because it, you need to dilute uh, way below endogenous level in order to recover these oscillations. So that actually creates this uh, hysteretic loop. Uh, so it looks like, oh, sorry, it looks like the system can switch in between oscillatory state and arrested state uh, in responding to concentration change. 
but also uh, depending on where is this from, so initial state. So uh, looks like the cells seems to have some memory about the, uh, their history in order to uh, respond to the to the signal change. And Chong, about two minutes left. All oh, right. Yeah. Thank you. So actually, I only have a few just to show our current uh, um, current uh, uh, studies. So we are trying to understand how the circular design plays a role uh, for the cell cycle response to these different environmental changes. And to do that, uh, we need to design some three-channel tuning system: one to tune the cell cycle speed, and the other to modulate uh, the the circuit diagram and the circuit uh, uh, wiring. And um, so I'm just showing you some preliminary data here. So here, uh, this is about the dilution response. If we remove the V1 um, double negative feedback loop, uh, we see that the cells seems to be more um, robust um, to the dilution. And also the cycle number seems to increase significantly. And this is true for uh, not only the dilution, the concentration change, as you see in the green curve here, this is the endogenous um, response. And the red is when you remove this positive feedback loop, you find that the period seems to be more stable against the, uh, the concentration change. And then the number of the period, uh, the number of the cycles also increased with that. And that's also true for the temperature response. And obviously this is still way early stage of the studies. So we are still trying to look into what's going on. And I'll stop here. Um, and uh, I want to give a huge thanks to a group of very fantastic postdoc and students, uh, especially the ones that I'm highlighting here, uh, who is behind the work I'm presenting today. And, and also thanks to my collaborators and um, supports and, and thank you um, for your attention.